Hello, everyone. Good evening. Uh, and uh, thanks for taking time on a Friday evening to attend this webinar and uh, to give a brief context of what we are trying to do here. Uh, so every year, September uh, 15th is the uh, Engineers Day in Karnataka or all over India for that matter. It's to commemorate the birth uh, anniversary of uh, Dr. M. Vishweshwaraya. So in Devopedia, we conduct a series of uh, tech talks and uh, we start today and uh, there are other uh, for ne next to two weeks, there are series of talks being scheduled. Uh, so it's in the interest of the community and uh, all of you can benefit from it. Jumping into today's topic. Uh, today's topic is the uh, basics of probabilistic programming using PyMC. Uh, so any idea of the people who are attending here, what is probabilistic programming? Any, any, any thoughts? What do you think is probabilistic programming is? I've heard of Bayesian networks. Yep. Probabilistic graphical models. Probably mm -hmm. related to that. Uh, Bayes has many ways to interpret Bayes. Yes, uh, probabilistic programming is uses Bayes uh, for its to uh, achieve its uh, end objectives. Uh, Bayesian networks are called probabilistic graphical models. They are slightly different, but uh, yeah, you can relate each of them here. So. We'll we'll talk more about it. Uh, we'll that's the idea of this uh, webinar, right? So we'll start from. Start. Hello, does anybody have anything to say? Okay, we'll start from understanding what is uh, descriptive statistics. So this is the simplest thing, right? We we all understand what is mean, median, mode, uh, what is variance, standard deviation. Uh, if you extend that understanding. We have two means, two standard deviations, one for population, one for sample. Population uh, metrics are represented with Greek alphabets, that is mu, sigma, r, etc. Uh, whereas sample uh, ones are with the uh, English alphabets. Sample representation, sample metrics, or sample statistics are all represented with the English alphabets. So for anything, uh, we have two such metrics. I, if you want to understand what is the average uh, weather uh, measure is going to be, what is the average uh, uh, salary of a particular population? So it's all average, right? It's all mean. But what is uh, sample mean and population mean? Sample mean is what we calculate from all the data that is at our hand. Definitely, we are not going to have that luxury of getting the average, uh, getting the salaries of the whole population. We will get, we'll take a sample and that sample is called X bar uh, is, is a part of the mu. That is the call, right? I take a sample and rely on that number. The word relay is important. How far I can rely on the sample statistic? Let's say the average temperature in Bangalore today is about 30 degrees. What does that 30 degrees even mean? How can I rely on that 30 degrees? Uh, that is 30 degrees centigrade for that matter. So uh, that's where we are heading to. So these are univariate statistics. For each of the sample statistics is questionable, whether it is univariate, bivariate. We find correlation be between two data sets. That also has a, something called population correlation and sample correlation. So any sample metric sample statistic we calculate is questionable. It's not sacrosanct, right? So if I go and take a different sample, I may end up getting a different number. Whether it is average or a standard deviation or a correlation coefficient, for that matter, anything. Uh, so let's uh, un understand what are the challenges in representing such sample statistics and how can we better our uh, claims and the estimates are not uh, limited to univariate statistics or bivariate statistics right we do we, we solve regression problems 
basically that is one intercept and multiple coefficients we call it beta not beta 1 beta 2 beta 3 or b0 b1 b2 b3 depending on what the what are we referring to whenever we build a model what we have is the sample representation that is b0 is the constant b1 b2 b3 are the estimates all of you with me so far so good and there are multivariate statistics even neural network weights for that matter. If you are familiar with the deep learning or the feed forward neural network or any any neural network architecture, there are hundreds and hundreds of estimates, right? Uh, uh, each estimate is a sample estimate for that matter. We don't know what the population estimate is all about. We assume sample is representative of the population and we go about uh, taking the sample estimate and uh, uh, make decisions. Whereas sample estimate is questionable, how do we answer that question is what probabilistic programming is all about. This is the foundations of what we are going to look today. Uh, any questions so far? So if there are no questions. I will take average for today's example. For that matter, uh, you can find the probabilistic uh, estimates for each of the uh, sample representation. Probabilistic uh, uh, estimates, actually speaking, yes. So I will take uh, mean as an example and explain the concept. How do we put probability for the estimate? And uh, we will also take it one level above. How do we get the probability for the regression estimates? All of you with me? Okay. So I start with uh, clearing the kernel and output of all the cells so that uh, we all understand. So we will be using PyMC3. So henceforth, I have uh, imported it. Other packages are all normal packages. So it imported all the library we want. I have created two small functions, sample data and sample data with outlier. Basically, with outlier is needed to explain uh, what uh, we are trying to do. And uh, this code uh, generates the sample data. Let's see what it generates. So this generates data between, let's say, 16 and 32 for that matter. Agreed? And uh, between 16 and 32. And uh, this has data somewhere. Or if you want to take a different data set, let's see, we got it. Yeah, we got a better data set. Between 16 and 30, the data set. Uh, the data set is for concentrated on two or three places and not so much on some extreme places. That's how the temperatures behave for that for the sake of argument. Now, if this is the data, what do you think an average is going to be? This is the collected data. This is the sample data collected from the field. We cannot collect uh, from every geographic coordinate, right? So we collected from selected uh, points in the city or in the country, and this is what we got it. Now, if somebody questions, what is the average temperature in your country? What do you think the average temperature is going to be? All of us know what is the average formula. We'll be able to calculate, uh, add all the numbers divided by the total number of numbers. Uh, we get the average. Now, this is for the whole country. Uh, let's say uh, I don't have the luxury of collecting for the whole country. I end up collecting samples from selected places. Let's say sample size of 5 or 10 or 15. In that case, where do you think the average will fall? Basically from this population, assuming this is population, I take five, 5 or 10 sample random points. Where do I get more points from? If I get, to, what are the chances of getting points? I, I have high chance of getting a point between 19 and 20 and some high chances of getting points between 24 and 26. Very little chances of getting points before 17, whatever it is. So I end up with the sample. Now, what do you think that sample average is going to represent? Any of you there? So let's see it. I have a function return. I have taken a sample. The sample gives me something like this, 19, 24, 19, 16, 21, etc. And an average for the sample is 20.31. This is a standard deviation. OK, this is a standard deviation. This is an average. What if I get a different sample? Just to keep track of this average alone, this time we got 20.3. 
next time we got 20.9 sometimes we got 22.05 21.91 so what is happening the average is falling somewhere here in this range i can generate as many samples i hardly get a average in less than 18 or greater than 26 but uh, this is what it is right so what can we conclude so this is the average and uh, if I ask somebody ask how reliable is your average? I got 24.61 as the average. So what do they mean by asking how reliable is your average? Let's say they go to the field and collect a sample. How uh, close is it going to be to the average which you told me? So let's say if we claim 24.6, somebody goes and takes a sample, they get 23.12. Sometimes they get 20. So 24 is at one end, sometimes at 20 at another end. So uh, that is definitely uh, not a uh, uh, you know good estimate to be handed over. Whereas we can say, I am confident my 20.02 as an average with some probability number. Agreed? Some probability number will comfort the person who is receiving this information. Now, how do I get the probability number? So what do you think the probability distribution is going to look like? So uh, one way is to collect hundreds of samples. Calculate average for those hundred samples. And then plot the frequency distribution. What do you think the distribution will look like? All of you understand when I say collect samples and plot a frequency distribution? Anybody needs a help there? We'll come to this central limit theorem and large law of law numbers. So I have a program which gets 1000 samples and plots a frequency distribution. And what is the frequency distribution? It will calculate the average for the first sample and increase the count. And it will calculate the average for the second sample and increase the count. Let's see what it throws up. So if you see there, first time we got 23, 24, 21, 24, 23 again, and uh, 22 new one. So if I go on collecting 1000 samples and populate this, populate this uh, frequency distribution, I end up what we call a normal distribution or popularly known as a bell curve. All of you with me, any thoughts, any questions so far? If there are no questions, I'm rushing. OK, uh, so um, for me, 1000 samples from the data set which we generated. This is the data set which we generated, right? This is the data set. This is the frequency distribution of the data set. And this is the frequency distribution of the mean. Or in for that matter, it is probability distribution. What is the difference between the frequency distribution and the probability distribution? In y axis, you have the count for the frequency distribution and y-axis you have the probability. Probability is nothing but number of uh, times we got a mean in this bucket divided by the total number of samples, in this case 1000. So we got a probability distribution for the average temperature, mean of average temperature. Let's generate one more, huh? just in case if people wanted to take a deeper look. So you see that one more sample, three samples, four sample, five samples look like this, six sample looks like this, seven sample, eight, nine, ten. And as the number of samples increase, uh, the bell curve, uh, the normal distribution gets formed. Once we have this normal distribution, we can put a probability number. What is the probability that uh, uh, the average temperature will fall in this bucket? Basically, number of values in this bucket divided by the thousand. Agreed? So I can put a probability number, but to put that probability number, what is the effort that is required? First thing, uh, we need sufficiently large samples. And we need thousands of samples or at least hundreds of samples 
to plot this probability distribution. Suppose in our use case, we got 20.02 as the mean average. And if we take 20.02, the average is here. And what we typically conclude is 20.02 plus minus 3 sigma as the range of values. That is how we plot the probability distribution, right? If 20.02 is the average, you can notice it here. It took the values mostly. We took five as a sample size. And it turned out to be everything was around 20. See, there is only one value about 24. There is everything is below 20. So the average turned out to be 20. And if we, are, if we don't have the resources to do multiple sampling, we will end up taking 20 as the average and the distribution will be, the bell curve will be formed around 20 as the average. And we will start plotting the probability. Uh, the probability, maximum probability is 20 and uh, the next probability to the maximum is either 19.5 or 20.5. Further low probability is 19 and 21. That's how we would have approached it. All of you with me? So, uh, yeah, I think is, Pradeep had a question. Yep, let's go for the question if you have a question. Yes. Yeah, Pradeep, you have a question. We are not able to hear you. You have to check your mic once. Hello. Yep, tell me. So, how do you define the range of that means? Like, it keep changing or like? The range will be constant for the samples. We are, if I if I remember correctly, we did not define any range for the mean. We just uh, took a sample, hundreds of samples. How many samples we took here? Thousand samples we took here, and we asked it to plot it. In fact, the range for the means is hard coded here between fifteen and thirty. It doesn't have to be fifteen and thirty. So we don't define it. Will be like twenty to twenty six like that. We don't. No, we don't define it. The samples will give an idea what the range should be. We are not predefining anything here. Based on the outcome, we we will yes. come to that. Yes. Oh, thanks. OK, this is if you have the luxury of collecting thousands of samples and plot it, then you will be able to arrive at a sensible estimate and a probability. If you don't have it, what if you end up with a number like 20 here? So if you end up with a number like 20, you will plot a bell curve around 20 and call it. That is the reliability and your probability numbers will depend on what your average is. Since your average is nowhere close to the maximum uh, no, uh, population average, the population average, what do you think the population average is going to be? We did not calculate the population average. OK, let's calculate the population average. Um, mean of combined data. Sorry, it is uh, NP dot mean, I think. The population average is 22.73, whereas the sample average we got is 22, 20.02. 20 Henceforth, uh, uh, this, uh, but when you collect samples again and again, your, pop, your population, your sample means will form a bell curve. This is what central limit theorem is all about. If you draw a sample of n values from any population with the mean mu or variance, if sample size is uh, sufficiently large and all the x bars, you, uh, you know, um, all the means calculated from the all the samples will follow. Basically, the mean will follow a normal distribution with the population mean and some standard deviation here. That's what central limit theorem says. You know, you want to know more about central limit theorem. You want to see more cool visuals. I would recommend three blue, one browns. Uh, uh, where is three blue, one browns? What is central limit theorem? And uh, why is central limit theorem is a normal distribution? I would recommend you to go through those two videos. You will get an idea of central uh, central limit theorem and why it ends up in normal distribution. So uh, fine. Um, now, how do I get a better estimate? This time, I, uh, I know the population estimate is 22.73. I don't know, actually speaking. 
we we started by saying that we have no idea about what the population estimate is but the estimate i get from the sample is not reliable all of you agree with me now how do i make it reliable all that i have to do is increase the sample size instead of 5 i make 50 let's see what is the average i get you see i get 22.772 i get i i make another 50 i make another 50 See now the sample is much closer to population mean. Sample mean is much closer to population mean. If I make five hundred, sorry. If I make five hundred, oh, what happened? Cannot take a larger sample than the population. Okay. Population itself is smaller. If I take hundred, see, it will be always close to twenty-two. It never went to twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three in that range. I can take n number of samples. This is what law of large numbers say. So the law of large numbers say for the smaller samples, mean can be anywhere, but as you Increase the sample size; it will converge to what we call population mean. So, to get a better, reliable estimate of the population, uh, we can increase the sample size, right? Then we are good. Now I have increased the sample size. I have got a number which is closer to the population mean. Now we can plot a bell curve and call that probability, right? So the probability uh, of uh, getting 23 is the maximum. 22.5 is next maximum, and 23.5 is the next maximum. And 22 is way lesser, and 24 is way lesser. We can plot the bell curve, and probability is done. So what does that mean? We have we have got a probability distribution of what the average is going to be. Is that the call? So all of you agree with this? We got the probability distribution of a average without collecting hundreds of samples by collecting only one sample that is large enough. So is this something everybody agrees to? Is this something everybody agrees to? And my next question will be. why should it be normal always is the world so simplistic you get any data and every data average behavior of standard deviation average behavior of age average behavior of regression estimates everything is normal the reality is that simple yes that's how what we call frequentists present the world frequentists say you take a sample large enough plot a bell curve around it you got a probability distribution then you take a call uh, whether it is a uh, whatever decisions let's say in the financial markets when to buy when to exit what is the based on the probability of what the price is going to be what the volatility is going to be all those questions are can be answered with this probability distribution so this is the frequentest way of giving probability to an estimate there is definitely an alternate way uh, before we go to the alternate way let's understand what are the shortcomings of the sampling from a large and diverse population okay first thing it is resource intensive which requires more time more budget larger sample sizes small sample sizes are not sufficient to effectively capture the underlying pattern understood second important shortcoming is time consuming you start collecting data by the time you end collecting data your behavior your data could have been very different anybody can think of an example you start collecting data on weather uh, by the time you stopped collecting it Weather would have changed if it is time-consuming exercise. 
yeah you are you, you are collecting data over a period of time in that case uh, you cannot wait for longer time because you need larger data set yeah that's a that's a challenge there and the sampling bias we have a sampling bias uh, small samples create that sampling bias we saw that right when we had a sample of 5 as a size See, we got a average that is 20. Not always. Sometimes we get 22.9. Sometimes we get 23. Sometimes we may get 26. Sometimes we may get 28 also. So we end up with a biased sample. The question here is how big is big enough? To calculate the average height of all Indians is 100 sufficient, 1000 needed, 10,000 needed. How big is big enough? Yes, there are sample size estimation techniques available. They uh, have some degrees of freedom, some degrees, though they don't have some degrees of freedom. For example, you have to fix this is the standard deviation I want. Henceforth, give me a sample size which can give me this kind of a deviation. There are techniques that will tell you how big the sample size should be. And uh, let's assume there is a sample size uh, sufficiently sample, big sample. Can there be more challenges? Or if I have to put the question, are there better ways to estimate the distribution for an estimate? Are there better ways to find the distribution for mean? Are there better ways to find a distribution for standard deviation? Are there better ways to find a distribution for your regression estimates beyond the central limit theorem? So, this is called frequentistic approach because you depend on the larger frequency. Frequency is the count. Uh, you depend on larger sample size and large number of samples to you know to conclusively say something is this or not. Uh, I take a sample with the outlier. Sorry for it. This I have cooked up. So for this stamp sample size of 10, what are the samples I got? And we got an average of 25. You think the average is 25 for this sample? Is how likely I'm using the word likely consciously. So please pay attention to it. How likely 25 is the average of this sample? When I say how likely, I can also ask the same question. How likely 18 is the average of this particular sample? 18 also could be the average. This is after all a sample. From the population, I may get a, a sample which gives me 18 as an average. From the population, I may get a sample which has 27 as an average. So from this set of numbers, can you tell me a sample? How likely I get a sample with 18 as an average? Assuming this sample represents the population. Less likely, 18 is less likely people, you are with me, because the sample says most of the numbers are between 26 and 28. There are hardly any numbers less than 20. So it is less likely a sample will give me an average of 18. Agreed? It is not impossible. It is likely, but less likely. It is more likely a sample will give me an average of 26. All of you with me? It's not impossible that I won't get a sample of with average 18. I am likely to get a sample with average 18, but it is less likely. All of you with me? So uh, the problem is I cannot go with 25 as an average and put a bell curve around it, call that a probability. So Bayesians use this likely concept. Use the likely concept and from the evidence, this is what they call it evidence. You got a sample. Use that sample as an evidence for, and plot a likelihood plot. Something is more likely, something is less likely. Use the likelihood to arrive at probabilities. This is the approach Bayesians recommend. So 
to recap, how did we arrive at this probability? We started with the samples. We started with hundreds of samples. Calculated average ended up with the probability. Agreed? Bayesians say, start with the evidence. That's where you have to start. But use likelihood as the means to achieve your ends. We will discuss beyond this. After this, we'll be discussing Bayesian. Before that, I would like to know any questions, any thoughts? So from anybody in the audience? Any questions, any thoughts so far? All of you comfortable with the frequentest approach for probability distribution for an estimate? Agreed? Okay. Let me move on. Okay. All of you must have seen this Bayes formula. This is the evidence. This is the likelihood. This is the prior. This is the posterior. Many people would have had challenges. I had challenges in getting my head around this formula. But eventually, I got an understanding. So bear with me. We'll, we'll solve this formula. We'll understand what each and every formula means. Okay. So we know the data. We know the data. Data is between, well, let's say 16 and 30. That is the data. Agreed? So they say, Bayesians say, let's define a prior. This is something we are defining it beforehand. Between 12 and 30, there is an equal probability each of them could be mean. Average could be 12. Average could be 14. Average could be 16. Average could be 18. All of them have 10% probability. That's the prior. That's an assumption. Does is not does that does not reflect the reality? All of you with me? This is the mean, assumed mean. We don't know what the mean is. We got evidence. We got a sample. Uh, and then we are assuming the mean could be between 12 and 30. And uh, I've made a discrete case here. We'll talk about the continuous case also. And the prior turns out to be, I've assumed prior is equal. All of them have equal probability. Probability that mean is equal to 12 is 10%. Probability that mean is equal to 14 is 10%. Probability that mean is equal to 16 is 10%. Probability mean is equal to 30 is 10%. This is the uniformly distributed values. So we call this uniform prior. All of you with me? Now let's put a likelihood. We'll do it manually. I'll explain how it is done in the program. Okay. All of us discussed. What is the likelihood the mean will be less than 18 from the sample? So mean will be less than 18. The likelihood will be zero. Agreed? I'll put likelihood as zero. What is the probability the mean will be less greater than 27? The likelihood will be zero. Okay, let's take likelihood is a relative measure. So I'm putting one for what my sample says. My sample says 25.44. So I would put uh, one for 25.44. Okay, and what is the likelihood the mean will be 18? Uh, based on this, 18 and 19 is very little, about 20 is more. So I put a number 0.25. That is uh, one fourth of what my sample likelihood is. I'm, I'm making up this number, okay? Um, I'm, in fact, I can give a three is a likelihood, more likely, and this is two, this is one, this is one. So, and this is less than one, let's say 0.5. This is the likelihood. I'm manually putting it. This is my judgmental call. We'll talk about how systematically we'll do it. Okay, so we got two numbers, prior and likelihood we got it. All of you understood how prior and likelihood comes into picture. Prior is nothing but a uniform distribution. That is my assumption. But from the data, I understand there is no chance 12 could be mean. From the data, I understand no way 14 could be mean. From the data, I understand no way 16 could be the mean, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the likelihood. All of you with me? So what do they do here? Prior times likelihood. 
So let's do a prior times likelihood. My this code does the job for you. OK, let's see how I when I plot it, whether I get a good distribution. See all the priors are uniformly distributed. This is my likelihood and this is my distribution. This is my distribution of the probability distribution of the mean. Now I can put a probability. What is the probability I get a mean that is more than 22.5? What is the probability I get a mean that is less than 20? What is the probability I get a mean that is equal to 22.5? All of you with me? This is very important. There is one gap. I hope somebody finds it. This is our understanding. This is the prior. This is the likelihood which we presented. And this is prior times the likelihood. And I plot all of them. This is the prior. This is the likelihood. Prior times likelihood. I get it like this. This is my probability distribution of the mean based on the data we got it. How many of you have problems to get to this level? Or everybody good with this? So the prior times likelihood is called, uh, actually prior time likelihood does not add up to one. If you see the points here, it doesn't add up to one. How do we get it adding up to one is you add all this divided by the number. Then it will all add up to one, right? That's what the denominator is all about. So prior is what we assume. Likelihood is from the data. Division is only a normalization factor. It all should add to one. Once it adds to one, the chart is going to look same. Now I give a challenge. This is the prior we assumed. All of you with me. Now I am telling I have a information. The mean is more likely to be in the range of 20s. And less likely to be elsewhere. So I am disturbing the probabilities, prior probabilities. What are the prior probabilities? This is 0.25. This is point. Uh, sorry, point 0.18, this is point 0.15, etc., etc. This is point 0.13, this is point 0.10, this is point 0.01, and this is 0. Okay, and then I put a point 0.08, whatever, and I put a point 0.01, I put a point 0. So this prior can be anything I put it. This is the assumption after all. All of you with me? Instead of a uniform distribution. Okay, and there is an extra point. Where is this? I thought I removed it. Okay, here it is. See, this is my prior knowledge. The mean is going to be most likely to be in 20 and less likely to be elsewhere. OK, this is the probability distribution. This should add to one. It is not. I made up the data, so it won't add up to one. If this is the prior knowledge and if this is the likelihood from the data, if this is the assumption, this is what evidence says. Assumption times evidence will give me the probability distribution for the new mean. All of you with me? This is what they call it Bayesian approach. In Bayesian approach, we start with the assumption, not with the data, by the way. In the frequentist approach, we start with the data, collect hundreds of samples, calculate the mean, plot the probability distribution. In the Bayesian approach, we start with the assumption, get the likelihoods from the data, calculate the probability distribution. Is everything clear? I don't see any questions coming from any quarters. So that evidence is just normalizing factor. Evidence is normalizing factor, yes. 
you need because this what we end up with is the posterior probability it has to add to one when you multiply likelihood with the prior it won't add to one so for that analytically evidence has complications practically evidence is nothing but normal normalizing fact and after you have calculated uh, you will assign the posterior to the prior for the next iteration that is called bayesian learning you want to learn so you started with the assumption you got a new evidence incorporate that evidence and get the posterior and you can use that as a prior for the next set of evidence that's called bayesian learning yes for bayesian machine learning that's how it is used that's called bayesian learning yeah this is what the uh, bayesian way of finding the distribution okay so we checked how do we get the priors prior could be uniform distribution prior could be normal distribution prior could be exponential distribution prior could be your random or your custom distribution what we made here is the custom distribution and that is one factor so we understand what prior is we made up the likelihood but we need a system to calculate the likelihood from the data so prior can be within a fraction of a second you say i want a normal distribution it's going to give a normal distribution you ask for a uniform distribution it's going to give a uniform distribution no 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 big deal with that but likelihood we manually put some numbers here let's see how to find the likelihood that's where the libraries come into come in handy before going to the pymc library let's discuss one important concept okay so here i had to comment something yes now this is the normal distribution everybody knows and this line is corresponding to point 1 what is the probability that i get one from this distribution can somebody answer that this is a continuous distribution all of us know how to calculate a probability from a frequency distribution right the number of values in that bucket divided by the total number of values will give you the probability like what we did here number of values in this bucket divided by the total number of values will give me the probability in this case now in the normal distribution case i want to know what is the probability i end up with value 1 anybody wants to take a shot it's very important 0.25 0.25 is that the answer so if you add up all the number all the probabilities it should add to 1 right if probability of getting a value is 0.25 probability of getting a value 0 is 0.40 probability of getting a value minus 1 is 0.25 like that if you add all the probabilities it will it add to 1 actually speaking taking that approach we should know how many lines like this can be drawn you see a gray line how many lines can like this can be drawn and what is the count of count in this line it is actually zero probability of getting a value one from this distribution is zero let's say this is the salary distribution that is minus uh, let's say this has minus also let's take a continuous distribution for that matter uh give me an example let's take the weather example the distribution of weather is between 16 degrees and 35 degrees what is the probability you will get a 16.534 as the number what is the probability you get 25.2892 it is zero the number of times you get 25.2892 divided by the total number of samples will be very 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 minimal is that do you agree to that so in continuous distribution case that is not how probability is dealt with okay i uncomment one line it will make lot more sense in continuous distribution case the probability is going to be the area in the green divided by the area in the purple that is 
probability between 0.9 and 1.1 that is nothing called one that is very you can i can understand the probability between probability of getting average temperature between 35 and 36 you can find it or 34.9 and 35.1 you can find it you can never find probability that you get 35 degrees probability you get 35 degrees is zero probability you get 34.9 and 35.1 is more likely so in a continuous distribution case the probability is calculated like this the area in green divided by the area in purple or the total area under the curve not purple uh, purple is behind the green also the area occupied by the green area divided by the total area under the curve is the probability in case of uh, the previous chart in that case it will be zero almost close to zero that is that's not a probability and 0.25 is not a probability for that matter understood this is a probability density not a probability and what do you see in y axis actually this should be likelihood this is the likelihood of getting one likelihood don't add up to one likelihood is a relative metric what does this mean what do i mean by relative metric let's take two two points to point one for the sake of or 1.8 points to point one agreed and um, uh, and 1.5 points to points to 1.8 points to point 1.5 1 points to point 2 that means 1.5 is two times more likely than 1.8 all of you with me all of you understand why this red dot is likelihood Let me put it for you. I'll add one more red dot and then it will start making sense. OK, so what is the when what is the point here in two? I have given two, is it? Yeah. This is one point. This is point zero five. Let's say this is point zero five. Two is point zero five and point two five is one. So getting one is two times likelihood compared to two this is the likelihood concept it's a relative number probability is an absolute number so if i to go back to the previous example if you notice we started with the one that is 20 is a one how likely compared to 2018 would be the so 50 percent likely 200% likely, <coughs> 22 is going to be the thing. 300%, three times likely, 24. Three times 20. 20 is the base. And 22, I get 24 is three times likely compared to 20. So likelihood is a relative metric. So that's what is happening here. This is the likelihood. So you can create a distribution for likelihood we notice that prior prior can be what i want it or prior can be a disciplined distribution it could be a normal distribution it could be a uniform distribution it could be a it could be a exponential distribution prior could be any distribution like that likelihood called could also be a distribution so likelihood is the points in this blue line Probability is about area, not the blue line. So what do we understand? Both prior and likelihood are probability distributions. Prior, I can decide what distribution should it look like. Likelihood, I can design what distribution should it look like. Basically, it's going to create two columns of data depending on what distribution we choose. And it's going to multiply those two and normalize it. You are going to get the posterior. So this is the concept behind the base. Is this clear? 
all of you understand the difference between the probability and the likelihood probability will all add to one likelihood doesn't have to add to one it will not now whatever we explained here so far to arrive at a distribution for a estimate is what pmc is pi mc is simplifying it pi mc is the library which will do all this for you you don't have to sit and give priors you don't have to sit and likelihoods all that you have to say for prior take this distribution for likelihood take this distribution calculate me the posterior distribution and give it to me i'm happy to take it so i'll be going to pi mc next if you want to stop me here for any reason, you can. OK, then we'll quickly switch to the Pi MC. Yes, I am generating a sample of uh, 100 or 1000, whatever uh, I can do it. And this is the sample looks like. And the sample is not a small sample, so we cannot identify likelihood. It is a, essentially that's what it is. Now this is the Pi MC model. You define a Pi MC model. You say I want a prior from a normal distribution or I want a prior from a uniform distribution. Uniform distribution, you give the starting value and the ending value that is called lower and upper and store the posterior in this variable. Understood? So let's start with the uniform distribution and I mentioned the likelihood. And you do the sampling. I'll come to sampling shortly. And give me the posterior distribution. It's going to do the same thing which we did manually there. Okay, let's uh, give it a minute. It's going to take one second first time and then it will do the job. Hmm. Takes a little longer this time. Probably this is the first time it is doing it. Let me stop and run. OK, let me stop and run it. OK, I've given 1000, 2000 and the sample size is 100. That is still fine. Yeah, I started doing it. OK, so we'll come back to what this says. This is the distribution you got. This is not a normal distribution. First thing. You got a mean and you got 95%, 94% high density intervals. So the 94% of the mean will be between 21 and 25. We saw the what is the mean of the population? Uh, it is 22.75 is the mean of the population. What did we end up here in the this thing? 23 years, the mean it has ended up. Now, if I want to change the prior and see if things are going to look better, why not? I change the prior uh, from uniform to normal distribution. And it looks more or less same. Now that we found this is the posterior distribution, nothing but uh, you can get all the metrics in a variable and uh, use the metrics for further processing. This is simple. All that we did is give a prior. Tell me what the likelihood should be given the data and then it will do the job. That's all. OK, uh, now let's extend this a bit. I have a mean, I have a sample. Why should I estimate only the mean? I can estimate the standard deviation also, right? So I can give two priors. And get the likelihood and uh, do the job. So this will give me two distributions. What is the range of the mean? What is the range of the standard deviation? See, mean is going to be 23. Uh, mean of the standard deviation is going to be 3. And the standard deviation varies between 2.6 and 3.4. So all this we are concluding about the population. We don't have any idea about the population. That's where we started, right? We have only sample. From the sample, sample gives me a mean, but I still wanted much more reliable claims. 
instead of giving me a mean, give me a distribution. Let me know the probability. Then I can take that. This is the interval estimation. Okay, the mean is going to be between 22 and 23. The standard deviation is going to be between 2.6 and 3.4. This is a better claim than what the point estimators. Rather than saying mean is 23 and uh, standard deviation is 3, uh, we can give this distribution. So, so far, any questions? The code is very simple. It can get complicated. That's a different story. So, uh, the, you compared a uniform distribution prior and uh, normal yes. prior, right? Yes. So, does it converge faster with normal prior? That is the idea. In this case, you don't see a difference because I have tuned it to 1000 and 2000 new iterations, 3000 iterations. Eventually, uniform will also look would have refined. If you have a better knowledge about the prior knowledge about the data, you go, uh, you know, you do it like that. With uh, If you don't have any prior knowledge, it will take longer time to converge. Let's say if it is a uniform and I go and reduce the number of samples to uh, 200 and I say I don't tune it. Okay, and uh, I don't even have to give all this. I'll come back to all this. Let's see what it shows. So look at the distribution. It still gives the more or less same uh, intervals, but the distribution is much wider. What was originally? Originally, um, this is the uniform. Uh, let's do the same. I will only change the distribution to Uh, prior to normal. Look at the distribution here. It's between 22 and 25. The It is more pointed. Here it is more. So it will affect. What you give as a prior will affect. If you have a better knowledge about the data, you embed it into the prior. That is the idea. OK. Let's go one level further. So it takes it does two samplings. We'll come back to sampling. I'll quickly cover sampling. Uh, before that, should we try something else? Yes, and we know we did mean and standard deviation. And um, OK, that's the output here. You have a mean posterior, standard deviation posterior. You can decide what priors for mean. In this case, what prior for standard deviation? Standard deviation is going to be all positive, henceforth half normal. Half normal is after zero. It will ignore all the values before zero, and uh, it will calculate the likelihoods, and it will do the posterior for you. Okay, And uh, that is made available to you as a chart here. And uh, this is not normal looking chart. Normal distribution is a perfect bell curve. This is not the case. OK, let's do this for the linear regression. OK, uh, we did this. I'll do this for the linear regression. Let's generate the data. So this is the data. This is generated data. What do you think y equal to mx plus c? Or uh, what do you think uh, the c is? What do you think the m is from this data? In fact, I have given it already. The intercept, I said, make it 5. 5 should be the intercept and the deviation here is 1.3. The slope is 1.3. So that's how I have constructed. Let's see what the now I have defined B1 prior, B2 prior as normal distributions. And I calculate the expected value and uh, likelihood of the expected values arrived at. And uh, we did sampling uh, and then we find the posterior. You see here, you got two posteriors. B1 is between 4.4 and 5.2. We gave five. If you remember, I gave five for the B1. And the B2 is between, that slope is between 1.2 and 1.4. The mean is 1.3. So you now you got a better picture of what your estimators. Your prediction will also be a distribution, by the way. If you, you have to take the samples from B1 and B2, and you have to create a distribution for your prediction. That is a 
that is a, that is for another day. But today, uh, how to get a distribution for the estimates using two approaches. One is frequentist approach, another is Bayesian approach. And we have done a regression estimates based on Bayesian approach. This is called Bayesian linear regression. How many of you heard about it? Bayesian regression? Yeah, this is what it is. So if you do, it's it's all based on sampling. So uh, second time I run it, it, I may get it slightly a different uh, chart. But mean and uh, intervals should be more or less same. So I run it one more time. It will give me a slightly a different one. Okay. And uh, this is called, there is one concept which is to be covered here is the sampling. So in all of the uh, uh, PIMC, uh, you take sample from the prior and posterior, prior, basically mean prior or a, what did we do here? Let me go back to the manual step which we did. Yes, we took all the values. We we also sampled it. The value, the, the, what all could should be the thing? That could be the mean could be between 10 and 30, right? We skipped 29. We skipped 29.5. We skipped 29.9. We skipped 26.8. We skipped all of them, if you remember. So we sampled basically this is a systematic sampling, uh, not advisable. Just to explain, I sampled like this. And we did not draw the sample from a, a distribution. So I have we have taken only one sample from all of them. So if you want to sample again and again, then the weight for the likelihood will go up. So there are multiple sampling algorithms. The popular one is the Metropolis Hastings. So Metropolis Hastings is the sampling algorithm. You have enough literature. It's slightly a complicated concept. Uh, I would recommend you to go through some YouTube videos if you are interested and learn about it. For as far as PIMC is concerned, even if you don't give sample parameter, that is a step parameter. It will uh, assume nuts as the sampler. That is a no U-turn sampler and it will do the job for you. There are multiple sampling algorithms, Gibbs sampling algorithm, Metropolis sampling algorithm. Uh, there is nuts, there is slice sampler. Uh, not all of them are available in PIMC, but most of them are. You want to choose the sampling. Let's say for that matter, I choose the Metropolis sampling. And let's see what is the outcome looks like for the mean. See, it gives me more nuanced distribution. It's not a very smooth distribution. So sampling algorithms uh, impact uh, your posterior. So be uh, you know uh, be aware of it. Choose the right sampling. See the posterior makes sense. Otherwise, keep playing with it. So PIMC is the easiest way. Uh, your uh, uh, you can get the distribution for any estimate you wanted. And uh, Bayesian uh, deep learning also is there. For every estimate, for every weight we uh, you know, uh, arrive at in the uh, neural network, there is a distribution made available that is computationally intensive. So it has not caught the imagination of a lot of people. But if you're a Bayesian, you want to do something like this, you should explore. Yep, that's pretty much what I had. Uh, any questions, thoughts? We'll take it up now.